Turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Our lesson will be coming from there today. If you're visiting today, um, I am not Hank Meadows. He is in Brazil on an evangelism, evangelism missions trip. And so if you came here to check out Hank's preaching, you'll have to come back next week. Today you have to put up with this old retired Navy chaplain. Well, uh, you know, I, I did uh, 34 years in the military. So our kids were born while we were in the military. They grew up in the military. And when they reached adulthood, I was still in the military. And as they reached adulthood and they went to school and had families, we often found ourselves separated from them. On one occasion, we were stationed in Washington State. It was kind of cool. That was a cool assignment because we had this little cabin in the woods at the foot of the Olympic Mountains, 900 square foot cabin. Can you imagine? It was amazing. We loved it. But our kids were here in Virginia. On another occasion, we did a tour in Hawaii. We had this amazing porch. We could oversee the city of Kailua. We were up on a hill. And we were there during COVID. And that porch was amazing. We could just sit there and veg out during COVID and we could look over the city of Kailua. Had palm trees and bamboo around us. But our kids were in Virginia. And we longed for them. We, we yearned for them. We were worried about them. We worried on whether they were growing in their faith or not. We worried on whether they were doing the things they were supposed to do and not doing the things they shouldn't do. We were worried about whether the tempter had tempted them and caused them to fail in their faith if the devil was having his way with them. And so we longed for them. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul, how he yearned for, how he longed for the Christians in Thessalonica. Pick up your reading, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, go down to verse 17. Paul writes, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at His coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the Gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we, are, we were destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it is it has come to pass, and just as you know. <clears throat> and for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I set to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Today, I'd like to explore Paul's longing for the Christians in Thessalonica. Why did he long for them? Why was he worried about them? What was on his mind? First was this. Paul longed for them because they were his hope, his joy, his crown of boasting for when the Lord comes. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at His coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. 
The Christians in Thessalonica were Paul's hope, joy, and crown of boasting. They gave him hope as they developed and matured in their Christianity. This brought the Apostle Paul hope. It brought him joy. It was the crown of boasting. It was the crown of blessing that God gave the Apostle Paul in his life, in his ministry, that, he, that God gave Paul those Christians in Thessalonica as they grew and they matured. I like what Spurgeon wrote about this text. And what I, what I like about what Spurgeon wrote is that Spurgeon was a pastor. He had the perspective of a pastor. Let me, let me share with you what he wrote because this is a pastor's perspective of his congregation. He said this, the steadfast, speaking of the church, the steadfast become our life by stimulating us to greater exertion. I believe the steadfast, the church, help the minister to a high degree of usefulness. And what the man of God sees, is, or when the man of God sees his people living to God at a high rate of piety, he speaks many things that otherwise he would never have spoken. He glories in the work of God, and with no bated breath or trace of hesitation, he points to his people and he cries out, See what God has done. He exalts over his converts with a holy joy. He cries, see what they used to be and what they are now. See how life has been made to spring up in the midst of death and how light shines where before darkness reigned. The perspective of a pastor. You know, Hank is shared with you from this pulpit on occasion that he and I have lunch together often. And you know, you, know what he, you know what he talks about? When we're at lunch, you know, what he, you know what Hank talks about? He talks about you. He talks about this church. You see, when a, when a young man comes to him and he says, you know, Hank, I'm, I'm thinking about going in the ministry and I'm graduating high school and I'm going off to college and I'm going to start taking some religion classes, Hank, his cup just overflows with joy. And he knows his work is not in vain. When a young woman comes to him and says, Hank, I've become a Christian and I want to devote my life to Christ and will, will you baptize me? Hank is filled with hope. When a young couple come to him and say, Hank, we want to we get married and we want you to counsel us and we want to have a Christian family and, and, and Hank brings them and he counsels them and, and this couple, they get married and they begin to live a Christian life and develop a Christian family. He just... heart just explodes with joy. You see... We, we attend here, my wife and I, because we think we have a good pastor and, and I know how he feels about you. Talks about you when we're at lunch. You see, when he passes something on to you and you embrace it and you make it your own, you become his crown of boasting before the Lord. You know, I have, I have this grandson. Many of you know that my, my hobby is, is bass fishing. Last summer, our grandson came to stay with us for a while and do a little fishing, and he wants to learn about fishing, right? And so I taught him some things. I taught him how to tie a palomar knot. And I, and I taught him how to tie a, a trilene knot. You know why I taught him that? Because that's what my grandfather taught me. And this summer when he came back, he, he hadn't caught a fish. And so the, the goal this summer when he came to visit us was to catch his first largemouth bass. And so I took him down to Heiko Lake. And uh, we got, got out our lures. And I said, 
here, Liam, here's a lure. Try this one first. How, you know, how are you going to tie this on? He says, Pop, I'm going to use a Palomar knot. How do you think that made me feel? My, the first knot my grandfather taught me was a Palomar knot. And my grandson is using a Palomar knot to tie on this lure. A little while later, he's trying another lure. He's, I said, Liam, what kind of knot are you going to I'm going to use a trilene knot, pop up. And the second knot that my grandfather taught me was a trilene knot. And I taught our grandson how to use a trilene knot. And my heart is just exploding. Because he's growing and maturing in his skills for fishing. And that might seem like a trivial thing, but it makes me happy. He did catch his first bass. In fact, he caught six of them that day. What I forgot to do, I forgot something, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make this right. You know, when you catch your first bass, you, you should get a fish slap. Right? When you catch your first one. And so when we're, this spring or this fall, he's coming, we're going we're gonna to go do some striper fishing. When he gets his first striper, he'll get a fish slap. You know, when Hank teaches you about Christ and he sees you growing in the grace and the knowledge of Christ, it just fills him with joy. I want, I want to read to you again what Spurgeon wrote because Spurgeon captured the perspective of a pastor in these words. And I want to read them to you again, and I want you to listen more closely this time. Listen to it again. The perspective of a pastor about his congregation. The steadfast, the church, become our life by stimulating us to greater exertion, more effort. I believe the steadfast help the minister to a higher degree of usefulness. When the man of God sees his people living to God at a high rate of piety, he speaks many things that otherwise he would never have spoken. He glorifies in the work of God. And with no bated breath or trace of hesitation, he points to his people and he cries out, see what God has done. He exalts over his converts with a holy joy. He cries, see what used to be and what they now are. See how life has been made to spring up in the midst of death and how light shines where before darkness reigned. Hank's not here today, so I can talk about him a little bit. I can brag on him a little bit. This is how he feels about you. So what does this mean? How should this affect us? Let that truth compel you to continue to grow in your spirituality, to continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ, to continue to grow in spiritual maturity. This is how your pastor feels about you. You are his hope, his joy, his crown of boasting before the Lord. That's why Paul longed for the Thessalonians. That's why Hank yearns for you. Number two. Why did Paul long for the Thessalonians? Because he was concerned about their faith. 1 Thessalonians 3.2. Pick up your reading. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the Gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. Look at that word establish. Why did Paul send Timothy? To establish them in their faith. This word means to, to strengthen, to fix to be made fixed in the faith. Paul was concerned on whether they were established, fixed, strong 
in their faith. He was concerned about that. That's why he longed for them. So let us ask the question, why is that important? Why did Paul consider it important that they be established in their faith? Strong in their faith? Fixed in their faith? Here's why. Because when we're not established in our faith, we become vulnerable to many things. I want to give you three truths that we are vulnerable to if we're not established in our faith. The first one is this. We can become vulnerable to false teaching if we're not established in our faith. Paul, writing to Timothy, wrote, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers who suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. If we're not established in our faith, we are vulnerable to false teaching. You know, I went to seminary at Liberty. I was there from... 1996 to 2000, graduated in 2000 and went back on active duty as a chaplain. But while I was there, there was this name being thrown around. This young man who was identified as a, as a gifted speaker, a gifted teacher, a gifted preacher. He had, he had a certain kind of charisma that appealed to people. He was, he was seen to be maybe the next celebrity pastor that was moving up the ranks. And and Ed Dobson, another Liberty guy, had a church up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he brought this young man up to, up to the church in Grand Rapids and mentored him and brought him along. And then they started a satellite church in Jenison, Michigan called Mars Hill. And if you know that name, if you know the name of that church, you know who I'm talking about. Mars Hill was pastored by a man by the name of Rob Bell. I remember sitting in a class with Tim Clinton, and Tim Clinton was saying, Rob Bell is the man. He's got the right stuff. But when Rob took over Mars Hill, his theology began to struggle. He began to teach things like there is no hell. And that Everyone will eventually make it to heaven. You know, if you, if you accept that, that teaching, if you accept that there is no hell, and you accept that everyone eventually is going to make it to heaven, this, is, this was Rob Bell's own version of what we call universalism. If you accept that, then you have no need for a Savior. That is not orthodox teaching. That is not sound teaching. That is false teaching. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. If we're not established in the faith, we might, be attempt, we might be tempted to accept this false teaching. By being strong in the faith, established in the faith, we can ward off and recognize false teaching before we accept it. Amen? Secondly, if we're not established in the faith, we can be at risk we can be vulnerable to turning away from God in times of crisis. You know, in Exodus 32, it tells the story Moses had led the Hebrews out of Egypt. Took them to Mount Sinai. Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. He's up there for 40 days. And when he hadn't come back after a while, the, the Hebrews began to panic and become impatient. They, they said, we don't know about this Moses. We don't know if he's coming back. And so they got Aaron, and then they said, Aaron, make us another God that we might worship. And so Aaron took their gold jewelry. Aaron took their gold jewelry 
and melted it down and made the golden calf. I don't know if it was out of panic or if it was out of impatience, but it was definitely out of not being established in the faith that they turned away from God. And they told the Hebrews, this golden calf is the God that delivered us from Egypt. Can you imagine that? They turned away from the God that led them out of slavery and turned to a false God and gave Him credit for what God had done. We're not established in the faith. In times of crisis, we can be vulnerable to turning away from God. Third, if we're not established in the faith, we can be vulnerable to spiritual apathy. Spiritual apathy. Revelation 3, 15 and 16, Jesus said this, speaking to the church in Laodicea. He said, I know your works. In other words, I know you. I know what you've been doing. You are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jesus does not like spiritual apathy. We find an example of this in in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 2 and 3. Remember Eli? The story of Eli and his sons? Eli was a priest of God. And his sons were priests. Only the Bible describes Eli's sons as scoundrels. You see, they were having relations with the women that worked outside the tent of meeting. Inappropriate relations. And they were also, as people brought them sacrifices, they were keeping the best part of the sacrifice for themselves, offering up the, the lesser parts of the sacrifice for, as a sacrifice to God. And Eli knew what was going on. Their father knew they were doing this. At one point, he asked him, he says, why do you do such things? But you know, he never disciplined them. He never corrected them. He never held them accountable. Whatever he did, it was ineffectual. It was passive. It was apathetic. And in Eli's spiritual apathy, it came to a point where God had enough. And God went to Eli and said, I'm done with you. No longer are your sons priests. And to really drive the point home, God took their lives that very day. God does not tolerate spiritual apathy. If we are not established in the faith, we are vulnerable to false teaching. We are vulnerable to turning away from God in times of crisis. We are vulnerable to spiritual apathy. Number three, why did Paul long for the Thessalonians? Because he feared that Satan was having his way with them. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3.5. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. Why? Paul was concerned about their faith. Why? For fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Paul feared that Satan was having his way with them. You know, Satan has many strategies. Many. He's gifted at what he does. He's good at what he does. 
He's been working these strategies out, these tactics out since the beginning of time. He's much better at it than we are defending against it. Let me share with you some, some of his strategies. In fact, if you're taking notes, I want to share five strategies with you. The first one is this. He uses deception and doubt. Think about it. Go back with me in your minds. Genesis chapter 3. He goes to Eve and he simply asks a simple question. Did God really say? Did He really? And he's planting the seed of doubt in Eve's mind. And he was lying. He uses deception and doubt. Did God really say? Yes, God did. He tempts us through our needs, our ego, and offers us power. Go back to, you don't have to turn there, but you go back to Luke chapter 4, where Satan tempted Jesus in the desert. He tempted Jesus by, through Jesus' needs. He said, turn these stones into bread. Right? Jesus was fasting, he was hungry. Turn these stones into bread. He's tempting Jesus with Jesus' needs. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. He tempted, Jesus, he tempted Jesus by appealing to His ego. He said, if you'll bow down and worship Me, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. Tempted him with power. Satan uses our needs, our pride, and offers a. He says, if, if you just bow down and worship me, I'll give you power and position and social status. Right? I'll be honest with you, as a, as a guy who spent 34 years in the military, did I, did I see people compromising their faith to get to the next rank? I'm ashamed to tell you that I did. Right? I'm ashamed to tell you that I saw it. Satan will tempt you with it. Number three, Satan will tempt you by threatening you with public opposition and threat of persecution. So Mark, where, where are you at, Mark? Talked about Peter this morning in Sunday school. Turn Turn over to Luke chapter 22. All right. We're going to work through that. Go down to verse 31. Tape Satan will tempt us, threaten us with public opposition and the threat of persecution. Jesus is speaking here. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. What was Jesus' prayer? That Peter's faith wouldn't fail under the influence of Satan. And when you have turned again, in other words, when you have recovered, Peter, when you go through this, this endeavor, when you go through this experience with Satan, when you've recovered from it, here's what I want you to do. Strengthen your brothers. That word strengthen is the same word Paul used as established. And Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And you know the story. Jesus was arrested. Right? Peter follows him. Start a little fire in the courtyard where, where Jesus is put on trial. And in the glow of the fire, there was this little slave girl, this little servant girl. She's peering at Peter. She's looking at him really closely. And she says, you're, you're one of them. You're one of his followers. 
Peter says, girl, I don't know what you're saying. I don't know what you're talking about. A few minutes later, another one shows up and he notices Peter and he says, you, you were with him. You're a Galilean. You're one of them. And Peter says, man, I don't know this man. And then a third time, there was another who recognized Peter and he says, you're one of them. And Peter says, I do not know him. And at that instant, the cock crowed three times. What was Peter afraid of? Public opposition. The threat of persecution. It's a tactic of the devil. Tanya and I used to get the, the magazine from Voice of the Martyrs. Remember that? I don't know if they still have that anymore. There was a story in there about uh, Christians in North Korea. And they were having a house meeting. And in the midst of this house meeting, some Korean soldiers showed up and they broke into the house and they just yelled into the crowd, who are the Christians in here? And a lot of the people just scattered, ran out the doors and, and left. And there was only a few left behind. What were these people afraid of? Why did they leave? Public opposition, fear of. Fear of persecution. What really happened though, is after everyone, after a lot of them scattered and left, the soldiers said, well now we know who the real Christians are, let's worship. Tells a story, doesn't it? Satan will use public pressure, public opposition, the threat of prison. Satan will use suffering and despair. Remember the, the story of Job. Satan went to God and God says, well, consider my servant Job. And Satan says, the only reason he's faithful to you, God, is because you bless him so much. And God said, okay, let's test that. Go ahead, Satan. You go down and have your way with him. Just You have to spare his life. And so Satan went down and took away all of Job's wealth, massacred his family, left his wife, but massacred his family. We'll get, I can tell you about leaving. This. That's another story for another day. All right. But Satan will use suffering and despair to try to get you to fail in your faith. One of his strategies. And we know the story of Job. He stood up to Satan. Satan will use discouragement and affliction. The Apostle Paul talked about the thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12. How Satan had sent a messenger to afflict Paul. Paul prayed about this, this affliction. God's answer was, my grace is enough. Satan has many strategies. And what is he trying to do? Think about this. What is Satan up to? What does he really want to do? He wants us to fail in our faith. He will use all of these tactics to distract us away from what he's really trying to do. Cause us to fail in our faith. And we have to... Here's what we need to do. We need to block out the distractions and focus on what he's... We need to focus on staying in the faith, maintaining the faith when we're under attack. There's a story from World War II. You know what the Ruperts are, were? You know what Ruperts were? Anybody know the story? Ruperts were little rubber dummies. They looked like soldiers carrying a rifle. And to distract the Germans, when the, when the 101st Airborne came in and dropped out of airplanes over Normandy, they took these little rubber dummies and they threw them out the airplanes. Thousands of them. So the Germans would shoot at the rubber dummies and not at the real soldiers. What we need to do is understand that we need to stay focused on Satan. He's going to throw a lot of rubber dummies at us to distract us. You need to fire at Him. Stay focused on Him. He's trying to get you to stumble 
in your faith. In spiritual warfare, it's easy to battle against the wrong thing. We might be focused on politics. We might be focused on winning an argument. We might be focused on trying to prove something to others. Those are all rubber dummies. Scripture tells us, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. If we forget this, we might find ourselves shooting at the wrong thing as we engage in spiritual warfare. Don't let Satan's tactics get to you. Stay focused on maintaining the faith. So why was Paul yearning for the Christians in Thessalonica? Because they were his hope, his joy. They were his crown of boasting. He was concerned on whether they were established in the faith so they might not be vulnerable to false teaching, to turning away from God, to spiritual apathy. And Paul was concerned that Satan may have had his way with them. Let me bring us back just for a minute. We have a pastor who loves you. I know this because he talks about you when we have lunch. You are his hope, his joy, his crown of blessing. Don't let the work that he does be in vain. 